Yeah, let me uh, get your attention. And we will uh, learn our topics from chapter 8. I'm sorry? Yeah, we're going to do one chapter today. But, uh, Okay, so chapter 8 is all about hypothesis testing. Alright, listen up. So, the idea behind hypothesis testing is that we have what we call a hypothesis or a belief about the population. Usually, or at least in this chapter, it's along the lines that we believe the population has this proportion. So it might be, we believe the population is 50% female. Or maybe we believe in the population, 15% of people are left-handed. Or we believe in the population, something, something, something. Okay. We have a belief about that population, we call that a hypothesis. Then we go and we gather data to test the hypothesis. And at the end of the study, either the data refutes our belief, or it doesn't. Okay? So either we, when we collect data, it causes us to change our belief about the population, or the data we collected does not change our mind about the population. We are never in a position where we say the data that we collected proves or confirms or um, yeah, supports our initial belief. Okay, so the initial belief we have, we call that a hypothesis. It's called the null hypothesis, and I'll get into all the details of this. But we have what we call a null hypothesis, the belief about the population. We go out, we gather data, and maybe our data causes us to reject our initial belief. Either it does that, or it doesn't, okay? And if it doesn't, it just means we don't have data, or we don't have evidence to reject our initial belief. Now, the way we decide whether or not to reject our initial belief, or our hypothesis, is if it depends on whether or not our data is vastly different from what we would expect if the null hypothesis is true. Okay. So if our, we just assume our initial belief is true, we look at the data that we collect. And is our data that we collect very different from what our initial belief would suggest, or is it not? And if it's very different, then we would be in a position to reject our initial belief. But if it's not that different, well, then we say we don't have reason to believe. So for example, uh, let's say there's some country that you've never visited, or maybe some land, some magical island. And you go in with the belief that 50% uh, of the people on this island are female. And you go to the island and then you randomly select 100 people, and it turns out that out of the 100 people, 80 of them are female. Okay. If our initial belief about the island was true, that half of the island is female and half is male, then when we select 100 random people, we would expect around half to be male and half to be female. Okay. Sure, there's going to be some natural variation. Maybe you would get 52 males and 48 females, or maybe you would get 53 females or something like that. So that we expect some natural variation. But if we take a random sample of 100 people, and it's not even close to being 50-50, but it ends up being something like 80 females and 20 males, then probably our initial belief about the island, or about the population, is wrong. Okay, does that process of thinking make sense? <laughs> 
So that's what we do in hypothesis testing. Okay, so we we have an initial belief and we say, well, if this is true, I would expect to see this when I gather random data. And if what I gather is very different, then we say maybe our initial belief is wrong. If what I gather is not that different, then I say, well, I have no reason to doubt my initial belief. Okay, should I write kind of that down or uh, should we just say? Uh, <laughs> All right. So, well, it would take a very long time for me to write it all on the board. So let's see. Email the. We have the video that you can rewatch. Okay. So we begin. We believe that the population is 50% female, we might express it by writing H0. The null hypothesis is that P is equal to 0.5. Notice I do not write H0 is equal to 0.5. I'm saying H0 is that P is equal to 0.5. Because H0 is just saying my belief is that the proportion is 50%, the proportion of females. We then gather data. data is very different from what we would expect, if our belief is true, we have reason to reject that. 
might say that we do not have evidence to reject. So far, so good? Okay. Catching up. Still catching up, still writing. So this is just the idea, the big picture. <laughs> Okay. 
So this one, there are two possibilities. One is that the initial belief is wrong. Our null hypothesis is wrong. Okay. So this means P is not 0.5, and our random sample reflects this. one possibility. The other possibility is that the initial belief is correct. That null hypothesis is true. P is equal to 0.5. But Because of random sampling, <clears throat> my random sample somehow ended up with uh, eighty percent. <coughs> Concepts on parts, I'm trying to write them all on the board. Because I know the tendency is that when I talk, but I don't write anything on the board, no one writes it down. How likely or unlikely is this scenario? 
Well, you need to know how many actually, like, the whole population, how many uh, girls and... You, you don't, you don't, okay? okay? So, let me see. So how likely is this scenario? Okay, so we can rewrite this question to be um, the population is 0.5 female. If I take a random sample, that the proportion is not 0.5. Okay. 
the farther away from zero it is, the more unusual it is, right? I think you had a quiz where I just asked you which tiger or which horse is more unusual. Or tiger. So it is highly unusual for us to see um, a sample that is 80% female if the population is only 50% Sample that was 80% female leads me to reject the initial belief Formalize this hypothesis testing procedure. 
types of hypothesis tests. They're all, they're both, they both involve proportions. So the first one, um, we are dealing with one sample. Okay, and we have a categorical variable. Well, anytime you're dealing with proportions, you're dealing with categorical variables. We also come up with something called an alternative hypothesis. All right. And this is generally in the form P does not equal that number. Whatever that number was up here, 30%, you just say P does not equal 30%. hypothesis can be um, P is greater or P is less than 30% or whatever number it appears in your null hypothesis. Okay? And your choice of not equal, greater than, or less than is determined by how the problem is written. data collected. So for a one sample categorical variable hypothesis test, when we look at our data, we need to find n Hat. These are the two pieces of information you need to get from your data for this type of problem. So we'll learn other hypothesis tests, actually, you'll learn the other one today, and you'll need different pieces of 
define what we call the p value, okay? which is how likely are we to observe this data if the null hypothesis were true, which is what we did over there. We said, how likely is it for us to take a random sample and end up getting 80% female if the island is only 50%? Okay, so we're asking, what's the probability of getting our data if the null hypothesis were true? Find the p value. And the p value, definition of the p value, is the probability of observing your data. So finding your p-value involves a few steps. One is to figure out your z-score. Z-score. So z is equal. So in this case, the p-hat minus, I'm going to write p0. p0 is the value that you used in your null hypothesis. Divided by standard error. Yes. So this is a formula to find out the null hypothesis? No, this is, <coughs> this, you find your null hypothesis like this. Okay, okay so, so what you're doing now? This is to get your z-score to get your probability. Oh. Is that yeah, yeah, so this is, huh? p hat minus p0, this is the value, whatever number, <coughs> The number in your null hypothesis, p0, is the number in your null hypothesis. So in this case, what is our p0? 0.3. 0.3, exactly. And then you look up your z-score. This is not very much unlike what we did last chapter, right? It's very similar. Okay, look at your z-score in the z-table. Now, the area that you use, whether it's the area to the left or the area to the right, depends on your alternative. So, if HA has less than sign, Take the area to the left of the z-score. So if your z-score is right here, 
these are just example values that I'm making up. It's not from the problem that we actually did. And if the alternative has a not equal sign, take the tail area and multiply it by 2. So in that case, you find one of the tails probably the left tail is easier, and then you multiply it by 2, because you're taking both the left and the right tail. Take the tail area, and multiply it by 2. So in every situation, multiply If the alternative has a not equal sign. Pretty much in this example, you would take um, z equals negative 1.3 and multiply by 2. You would look up the area associated with z equals negative 1.3. Okay. That's your area, okay. and then you multiply the area by 2. Okay. And then you get the z of the area. No, then that's your area. Okay. And in that case, your area is your p value. So they, this gives us our p-value, right? So we're finding the p-value. First we get a z-score, and then we look up the z-score in the z-table, and depending on how our alternative is written, less than, greater than, or not equal, we get our p-values in those different ways. And then what do we do with the p-value? If the p-value is small, what does that mean? What is the p-value again? The, the p-what? The p-value. Probability of observing your data or something more. More or extreme. Treat. If the null hypothesis were true. Yeah, okay, so what does that mean? So if my p-value, all right, so let's think back to the island problem. I said, I believe the island is 50% female. I take a random sample of 100 people and I get 80% female. In that situation, was my p-value large or p-value small? Large. Just think, think before we shout out answers here. Okay. So the p-value is the probability of observing our data or something more extreme if the null hypothesis were true. Okay. So do we say it was likely or unlikely for us to find a random sample of 80 females if the island was actually 50% female? We said it was unlikely. Okay. So that means the probability of that happening was low. Okay. So in the island situation, we had a small p-value. So if the p-value is small, would we reject the null hypothesis, our initial belief, or would we say initial belief is probably not? We would reject it. We would reject it. So if the p-value is small, we have reason to reject 